Now we're on 18.5, Occurrence, Preparation, and Compounds of Hydrogen. Here we're going to describe the properties, preparation, and compounds of hydrogen. <laughs> Sorry, just kind of funny when the section title is exactly what the uh, what we're doing. Nonetheless, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, with water being the most abundant compound of it found on Earth. It is impar an important part of so, so many things, our bodies, um, ecosystems, air, it's everywhere. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless, and non-poisonous, and a diatomic gas at ordinary temperatures. It has three isotopes, protium, which is the normal hydrogen with one neutron, or one proton in it, sorry. Um, H2, which is called deuterium, so this has a proton and a neutron. Um, it's also abbreviated with just a D. And tritium, which is heavy hydrogen, if you will, um, which has one proton and two neutrons in the nucleus, also abbreviated with a T. We get one deuterium for about every 7,000 hydrogen atoms, and tritium, uh, you get one for every 10 to the 18th hydrogen atom. So tritium is very, very, very rare. Um, the isotopes, though, all have very similar chemical properties because they actually have identical electron structures. Um, but their physical properties do vary because of these varying atomic masses. You have tritium and deuterium that are much heavier than regular protium. Um, deuterium and tritium actually have lower vapor pressures than protium or regular hydrogen. Um, if you do electrolysis on heavy water, which is D2O or deuterium water, um, you can use that to get, it, get deuterium. We get tritium generally from nuclear reactions. Tritium actually is radioactive. Um, there's a few different ways of getting hydrogen that we're going to talk about, um, but basically all of them we need to break chemical bonds. So we might do steam and carbon or hydrocarbons, electrolysis, uh, acid metal reactions, or by reacting ionic metal hydrides with water. So the first way is from steam and carbon or hydrocarbons. So water is the cheapest and most abundant source of hydrogen. So what we do is we make it into steam and pass it over coke, um, which is an impure, impure form of carbon. Not the uh, coke you can buy, you'd be, yeah, not that coke, carbon <laughs> at 1000 degrees Celsius. Um, and this gives us a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So we get our hydrogen gas and carbon monoxide. We call this mixture water gas, um, and it is actually used as an industrial fuel. Um, if you take this water gas and mix it with steam with some catalysts, you end up converting the carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide, and this is called the water gas shift reaction. So the water gas reaction, you take your carbon in the form of coke and steam at 1000 degrees Celsius. And we make carbon monoxide gas and hydrogen, which this is water gas. Um, hydrocarbons we can get from natural gas or petroleum, and then we can pass steam over a nickel-based catalyst, which will also give us carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. Um, one example is propane, which has the formula of C3H8. And so we take propane gas with water at 900 degrees Celsius and a catalyst and we get carbon monoxide gas and hydrogen. Whoa, that's a weird looking seven. There it is. So this is our first method of making uh, hydrogen gas. Uh, we also have electrolysis, uh, which we talked about already in chapter 15? No, 17, 17, 17? I think. Um, and this uh, hydrogen gas forms when we take a direct current of electricity through water containing an electrolyte like uh, sulfuric acid. Um, and then that has the hydrogen and oxygen bubble out. Um, the hydrogen forming at the cathode and oxygen at the anode. So this is an example of an electrolytic cell um, using a battery. I actually did this experiment when I was in um, my freshman in high school. We actually did electrolysis using a battery. So we take some water and we add electric energy 
to separate out hydrogen gas and oxygen. Um, unfortunately, this is a pretty expensive um, method um, and may not always separate it the best, but it does. This is what happens. Um, and then if you notice the amount of gas that's produced on the hydrogen, in the schematic you can see it's about twice as much as the oxygen, and when you look at the stoichiometry, there you go, there's twice as many hydrogen atoms as oxygen um, produced. So we get twice the volume of hydrogen at the cathode. In the lab, the most convenient way of making hydrogen is by reacting metals with acids. So we take a metal with a lower reduction potential and it's going to reduce the hydrogen ion in a dilute acid to give us hydrogen gas and metal salts. So for example, we take some um, iron and we put it in di dilute hydrochloric acid. So take some solid iron, add this to some dilute acid. And we're getting that H3O from hydrochloric acid. So there's our chlorine. And this gives us Fe2 plus. So this would give us iron 2 chloride. So there's our metal salts. And then we get hydrogen gas and water. And here's a picture where we take some iron and add, where they're adding acid to it. So you see those bubbles. Um, and those bubbles is, are the hydrogen gas being produced. Our next method is reacting iron metal or ionic metal hydrides with water. So we take a hydride of an active metal and they can and these have the very very basic anion of H minus and we react it with water. Now this is a very expensive method but it's very convenient as a source of hydrogen and this is actually used for things like life jacket inflations and life rafts and military balloons. They hit the water so the water then reacts with the calcium hydride, for instance, to produce the hydrogen gas, which is able then to inflate things. So for instance, we take some calcium hydride. Okay, we have solid calcium hydride, and then we hit the water. And boom, we get this reaction. Calcium dissolves. And we, now we get aqueous calcium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So I thought this was a really cool thing to learn. Now we're going to talk about some reactions. Hydrogen itself is pretty inactive um, as far as reactions go under normal conditions, but once you heat it up it's going to enter into chemical reactions. Two-thirds of the world's hydrogen production is actually used for ammonia manufacturing. So ammonia is used for fertilizer and the manufacture of nitric acid. Um, and we also need hydrogen, aside from ammonia, um, for the process of hydrogenation, um, which we'll talk more about that in organic chemistry in a couple weeks. Um, but you may have heard this term or partially hydrogenated oil for things like margarine. So hydrogen is used um, to break double bonds in organic compounds. Um, it can also be used as a non-polluting fuel because it has an exothermic reaction with oxygen. You can control the conditions where it can burn in oxygen without exploding. Um, and what's interesting is there are such things as oxygen hydrogen torches, um, and these get up to 2800 degrees Celsius, very, very hot, and can be used to cut thick metal sheets. Um, and this reaction is also used for rocket fuel. Um, now hydrogen has that one, just that single one S valence electron, and there's two justifiable places on the periodic table for it because of it. Um, generally, you see it above group 1 because it can lose an electron and form this H plus cation. Um, you know, so it's got that, and it also has 1s, so, you know, it matches with the group 1 with 1s, but it's a gas, it's not a metal. So it can also be, in my favorite place, is above group 17, um, and this is because it only needs one electron to fill its valence. Um, and it can also, and then that would make it form the hydride ion H minus, but it can also share an electron to form a single covalent bond. And it's a nonmetal, so that puts it on the nonmetal side. Or maybe it should have its own location. I want to know what you guys think, and that is our discussion topic um, for this week. Uh, 
Um, so before they retired the fleet in 2011, liquid hydrogen and oxygen were used in the three main engines of space shuttles. Um, so you had two component compartments in the large tank that held them until the shuttle was launched. Now, when it comes to reacting with elements, hydrogen reacts with group one metals, and then from group two, it reacts with calcium, strontium, and barium when it's heated. And it forms these crystalline ionic hydrides with the hydride anion, so with H minus. Um, and hydrides are very, very strong reducing agents. So hi the hydride anion is a strong reducing agent and very strong base. Uh, you put it in water and it vigorously reacts, um, and it will also vigorously react with acids and form hydrogen gas. Um, if you have it react with nonmetals, it generally produces acidic hydrogen compounds. And I say usually um, because something like ammonia, NH3, and phosphine, which is pH3, are super duper, super weak acids, and they actually function more as bases. So these are those are kind of exceptions. Um, but when it, they're, it's bonded to nonmetals, the hydrogen has a one plus oxidation state, and interestingly enough, does not react with elemental carbon. Um, but as we increase our nonmetals electronegativity, we get these more vigorous and, elect and exothermic reactions. Um, when it comes to nitrogen and sulfur, it'll react with them when it, there's heat added. But when you react it with fluorine, it's an explosive reaction. And it can also be explosive when reacting with chlorine under certain conditions. Um, there needs to be, it needs to be handled with caution, even though it's relatively inert. But if there's oxygen around and you've got a flame, it can explode. Think Hindenburg, okay? Um, your book gives you this nice table, just kind of giving you a, um, just summing up the chemical reactions that hydrogen can have with other elements and some comments about their reactions. So we're gonna talk about some hydrogen compounds. Um, all nonmetals form compounds with hydrogen, except of course our noble gases. Um, but we're gonna talk mostly about nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and halogen hydrogen compounds. So we're first gonna start, uh, start with nitrogen hydrogen compounds, um, namely ammonia. And this is gonna form naturally when you have any type of nitrogen containing organic material decomposing in the absence of air. Okay, so um, for instance, I'm a cat lady, as you guys probably know by now, and um, there's certain type of litter that we have to use with um, kittens. So we use newspaper pellet litter because, you know, it's still, they still dig in it, but it's not toxic if they eat it. It won't plump in their stomachs or anything. It's nice and safe for them. Um, but what happens over time as they pee in it is you get this huge, this ammonia smell from the uric acid um, decomposing into ammonia. Um, it can also be pre uh, prepared in the lab by taking an ammonium salt and reacting it with a strong base. So for instance, if we take, uh, and then, oh, it also forms ionic nitrides um, uh, react when they react with water. So this here's a, an example of taking an ionic nitride. So we have magnesium nitride and we put it in water and we get magnesium hydroxide that precipitates out and ammonia gas. Um, the Haber process is the commercial way of producing ammonia um, by directly reacting nitrogen and hydrogen gases. So this is what happens commercially. So you take some nitrogen gas and hydrogen, and we have a catalyst and that gives us ammonia. So um, for my chem majors, when you go on to inorganic chemistry, you'll talk, you'll learn a lot more about the Haber process and all the steps of it. It's pretty cool. Um, now some physical and chemical properties of ammonia. It's a colorless gas with a super sharp pungent odor. Um, if you've ever heard of smelling salts, which you know you put them under someone's nose if they're passed out and it's supposed to help bring them back, um, that uses that ammonia smell. It smells awful. Um, it has a gaseous form that will liquefy to a colorless liquid um, pretty easily, but it has a boil that liquid has a boiling point of negative 33 degrees Celsius. 
Um, aside from water, it actually has a higher en uh, enthalpy of vaporization than any other liquid. So it's also used as a refrigerant. It's soluble in water. It can act as both a Lewis and a Bronsted base. Um, and it actually has a very similar size to the potassium ion and acts fairly similar to a potassium ion, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, it ha the lowest oxidation state that nitrogen can have is when it's in ammonia at an oxidation state of three minus. It cannot be further reduced, but you can oxidize it. So we can bring up that oxidation state, but we cannot reduce it. Um, it will burn in air to form NO and water. Um, and then we can make what are called ammonia derivatives by replacing one or more of the hydrogen atoms on ammonia with another atom or group of atoms. So this is the structure of ammonia here. That blue is nitrogen and each of the white atoms are hydrogens. Okay, so you can see the tetrahedral um, electron arrangement, but it has a um, trigonal pyramidal 3D shape. Um, so the electrons don't take up actual space, uh, other lone pair on the nitrogen. So we make an ammonia derivative by taking off one of these hydrogen and instead maybe replacing it with a chlorine or something. So we're going to talk about some ammonia derivatives. Uh, one is chloramine, and this is made by reacting ammonia with sodium hypochlorite, equal, aka base, or not base, uh, bleach in a basic solution. This is why you do not mix bleach and ammonia. Chloramine is potentially deadly. So for instance, so the overall reaction, we take some NH3. So we take ammonia, react it with the hypochlorite ion, okay, which we get from sodium hypochlorite, and that makes this chloramine. Um, if you have um, excess ammonia and you're at low temperatures, this chloramine itself can further react to form hydrazine. So there's our chloramine and there's more ammonia for it to react with. And we still have base there. And this gives us hydro hydrazine, N2H4. LCL minus plus water. So anhydrous hydrazine is actually pretty stable, even though it has a positive uh, free energy of formation. Um, you can also make it um, by reacting nitrogen and hydrogen gas to give you liquid N2H4. Um, but hydrogen, hydrazine itself um, is a fuming and colorless liquid. So fuming meaning it's giving off vapors all the time. Um, and it actually has some physical properties similar to water. It melts at two degrees Celsius, so just a little bit higher than water. Boils at 113.5, again, a little bit higher than water. Has the same density though, 1.00 grams per milliliter at 25 degrees C. Um, it burns very fast and easy in air and makes a lot of heat. Um, it can act as both a Bronsted and a Lewis base, but is a weaker one than that of ammonia. Um, it can also though, react with um, strong acids. And when it does this, it can form uh, these two different types of salts, N2H5 plus and N2H6 2 plus. So for the um, reaction in air, we take the hydrazine N2H4 liquid plus oxygen and air, and we get nitrogen gas and water. So here's ammonia and a couple derivatives. So you can see ammonia and then the H here is highlighted, replaced with a chlorine for chloramine, and then replaced with an NH2 for hydrazine. But you can still see that hydrazine is still considered an ammonia derivative because we took off a hydrogen from the nitrogen. Um, and added a different group. So next we're going to talk about some phosphorus hydrogen compounds, um, phosphine being the main one, uh, pH 3, and it is the most important phosphorus hydride. Um, it is an analog to gaseous ammonia. 
um, but we cannot form it with direct elemental reactions. We either have to take an acid or ionic phosphide. Um, uh, uh, sorry, we either have to take an acid and react it with ionic phosphide or do a disproportion disproportionation reaction of white phosphorus with hot concentrated base to make phosphine and hydrogen phosphite ion. So for instance, we'll start with um, the ion ionic phosphide. We take, for instance, aluminum phosphide and react that with acid. And that gives us phosphine. And aluminum. And water. And then the other reaction is by taking pho uh, white phosphorus, P4, and some base. and water. And this gives us the hydrogen phosphite ion and phosphine. Uh, phosphine itself is colorless and very poisonous, and um, but it smells like decaying fish. So pleasant, right? Um, it decomposes to P4, um, white phosphorus, and hydrogen gas with heat. So add a little bit of heat and it will decompose. Um, it burns in air, so it has, there's a lot of caution that has to be used with it. Um, but it is used as a fumigant for grains as well as in semiconductor processing. Um, you can combine it with the hydrogen halides to make these phosphonium compounds like PH4Cl and PH4I. Uh, it is a much weaker base than ammonia. Uh, if you stick it in water, it will decompose, um, and some of it, the phosphine, will es actually escape from solution. So if you, oh, sorry, I want to talk about that, um, the halides. So like PH4Cl, you put that in water, and it's going to decompose, and the PH3 then escapes from solution because it's not soluble in water. So now we're going to talk about some of the sulfur compounds. Hydrogen sulfide, it, H2S, it's a colorless gas, and this is what gives rotten eggs their smell, as well as hot springs. Um, it is actually very, very toxic. Um, and what happens is it paralyzes the olfactory nerves, so you end up not smelling it after a short exposure. Um, it's best prepared by taking a metal sulfide and reacting it with dilute acid. So for instance, if we take iron 2 sulfide, and give it acid. We get iron 2 plus aqueous and H2S comes off as a gas and liquid water. Now, sulfur in the metal sulfides and hydrogen sulfides are very easy to oxidize, so um, they're very easy useful reducing agents. Um, the sulfur itself generally tends to oxidize to elemental sulfur unless you have a large amount of an oxidizing agent present. Uh, oxidation itself will lead to the removal of hydrogen sulfide in natural gas sources. So this is what, where they think um, sulfur from volcanic regions comes from. Um, it's potentially from the hydrogen sulfide oxidizing uh, to form sol solid sulfur. So if we take mustard here, so we have our hydrogen sulfide gas and it oxidizes. That gives us sulfur and water. Um, the hydrogen sulfide is a weak diprotic acid and will dissolve in water to form hydrosulfuric acid. Not sulfuric acid, but hydrosulfuric acid. Um, and this acid will ionize in two stages to give us the hydrogen sulfide ions um, and then sulfide ions second. So, um, so we take, we get this S2 minus from the hydrosulfuric acid and water. And this gives us HS minus 
at OH minus. And then HS minus with water. Can give us back to H2S, which gives us, which is that S2 minus and OH minus. And then since H2S is a weak acid, its aqueous solution of soluble sulfides and hydrogen sulfides are basic. So remember if one's acidic, it's, um, oh my gosh, I'm spacing the name. It's opposite is acidic. Conjugate, there we go. There's the word. <laughs> All right, uh, hydrogen, halogen hydrogen compounds now. Um, these are binary compounds that only have hydrogen and a halogen, um, and they're all gases at room temperature. So HF, HCl, HBr, HI. Um, fluorine, chlorine, and bromine will react with hydrogen gas directly to form their hydrogen halide. Um, and this is a commercially important um, reaction to make HCl and HBr. Um, the non-volatile strong acids can react with metal halides to make gaseous to make a gaseous hydrogen halide. So for instance, um, if we take some CaF2 as our metal halide and react it with H2SO4, which is a non-volatile strong acid, we get calcium sulfate and hydrofluoric acid or hydrogen fluoride. Um, so we can also get gaseous HF um, from the as a byproduct from um, taking f from making phosphate fertilizer. Um, we react fluoroapatite and uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, for those that are just curious, what fluoroapatite's um, formula is, it's Ca five PO four three. Um, if you take concentrated sulfuric acid with a chloride salt, you will make hydrochloric acid, and we do this commercially and in the laboratory. Um, but we actually cannot do this for HBr and HI because uh, sulfuric acid will oxidize the bromide and the iodide. So instead of using sulfuric acid, you have to use phosphoric acid, which is a weaker oxidizing agent. So you take H3PO4, and react it now with the Br minus from HBr, or not from HBr, but from a, a, like a bromide salt. And that gives us HBr and H2PO4 minus. Um, all of our hydrogen halides are very, very soluble in water and form hydrohalic acids. Um, all of them also are strong acids except HF. Hydrogen fluoride is not a strong acid because the bond between the hydrogen and fluorine is so strong that the water molecules can't pull them apart very well. Um, they react with metals and metal hydroxides or carbonates and these produce salts. Um, of halides that are generally soluble in water with the exceptions of, there are some exceptions like silver chloride, lead two chloride, and uh, mercury one chloride. Um, they give, they also can give pro substances that have the properties of X minus, meaning of halide. So you, you know, you have this halide ion um, that has its properties, um, so you have the heavier the halide ions are, the better the reducing agent they are. The lighter ones um, or other oxi oxidizing agents will oxidize them. For example, bromine will oxidize iodine because bromine is right above it. Um, and chlorine will oxidize bromine. So this is actually a reaction that's done often in labs um, for general chemistry. You take some chlorine and then you get two Cl minus. Um, and then you can do that for all the others. Um, but then bromine, let's say we take some Br2, so we have some actual bromine, oh, it's aqueous, and react it with hydrogen iodide. What ends up happening is that bromine 
kicks off the iodine and, to, and becomes HBr. And then we get iodine gas, or aqueous iodine. So chlorine will do this to bromine, which will do that to iodine. Um, hydrofluoric acid is unique. <laughs> um, it reacts with sand, aka silicon dioxide, and glass, um, which is a mixture of silicates. So when we were talking about um, actually the, uh, the silicates um, and why we can't use them, uh, borosilicate glass, to store HF, um, again, uh, it's the same thing. It reacts with it. Um, but because it reacts with it, it's actually used often in glass etching. Um, it's also used to produce hydrochlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs. Um, we used to have CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, but those are really, really bad for the ozone layer. So now we have HCFCs, um, and these are refrigerants. Um, it's used to make plastics and propellants, as well as cryolite, which is Na3ALF6, which is used for aluminum production, um, and also used um, to make other inorganic fluorides that are used as industrial synthesis catalysts. Um, so when you have some SiO2, for instance, and so you've got your borosilicate glass, for instance, and we take some HF, maybe we're glass etching or we're trying to pour it in the bottle and failing, we make this SiF4 gas and water. Um, the other reaction with another type of silicate, CaSiO3 with HF, you get calcium fluoride, silicon tetrafluoride, and water. Hydrochloric acid is relatively inexpensive and very widely used in the industry. I mean, we use it all the time in the lab, whether it's a class teaching lab or research labs. It's all over the place. Um, it is also used to make metal chlorides, dyes, glue, glucose, and other chemicals. Um, it's used to activate oil wells and as pickle liquor, not the pickles we eat. Um, pickle liquor is used to remove the oxide coating from iron or steel to be gal galvanized, tinned, or enameled. <laughs> 